Hi, welcome to KEXP. I'm Cheryl Waters, and this is live on KEXP at home. And I am so excited to welcome our good friend, Julian Baker. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to see you again. Oh my gosh, it is really great to see you. And I was so looking forward to catching up with you today. I want to check in and see how you're doing. There sure is a lot going on in the world right now. And uh, much of it anxiety inducing. And just in general terms, I'm wondering how you're holding up. Are you in Memphis? I'm actually not in Memphis. I'm in Nashville. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. I decided to shelter in place here. Um, and wow, I was actually thinking about this just as I was preparing to hop on the call <laughs> of how just you know, every, I feel like everybody has been acknowledging the general chaos of the last year and then everything unfolding at Capitol Hill. It's just like, wow, it's really still going, you know, like, I mean, it's not, it's unsurprising to many people. And I, I wouldn't say that it, it's surprising, but it is extremely disheartening. I mean, I would have said probably yesterday, like that I'm doing pretty well. I'm doing as well as anybody is um, probably better than many people are because I am fortunate enough to be privileged to be relatively stable uh, financially and everything. But um, yeah. Wow. Um, just, it's just very disturbing on so many levels. What's going on on Capitol oh Hill right now. And uh, yeah. It's hate- just keep coming. Yeah. And I hate, I know that sometimes it's, uh, it's maybe something that you don't bring up in interviews because, you know, we're supposed to be talking about the music, but it is so, um, it's just deeply affecting, you know, it, uh, it, it feels good to be doing music, but at the same time, part of me is like, oh, I should have gone to law school (laughs) 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 to do something. About well, this, that's uh, an this. interesting segue because <laughs> <laughs> when you got off tour, I think after touring like three years, something like that, nonstop, a couple of years ago, you went back to school to finish your degree. And if I'm not mistaken, you finished, you got your degree a little over a year ago. And I have to say, I envision you as someone who enjoys school. Yes. What was that experience like for you? You envision me correctly then because I love school well I don't I didn't like high school at all um but I do love university environment and I have my own qualms about epistemic elitism and academia as an institution um that's inaccessible to a lot of people and I'm aware uh you know the the, especially the university environment isn't perfect, but I do really enjoy just learning new things. And it was nice, you know, it was nice too to go back and shift the primary focus of my life from every day performing a show and doing this thing that I, you know, consider to be my trade um, to doing something that had little to nothing to do with that and analyzing literature and art for my degree um so yeah it was really fulfilling to me and i didn't think it would be and now i think i'm probably gonna go get my master's and buzz off of touring for a while eventually again (laughs) was music a part of what you were doing in school as well as literature well um when i started i went to middle tennessee state university because they had a uh, like a well-developed recording industry program and I wanted to go for audio engineering um, because I knew knew <laughs> I like knew how to run live sound from doing DIY gigs at my church and house shows with little PAs and I wanted to learn how to do that better and uh, I transferred out of that program like two years in uh, and I was originally studying when I was still in school to be a a secondary education English teacher uh, in high school. Uh, And then I went back and that would have required me to do a year or more of on-site like studies in a school. And I envisioned myself returning to 
touring sooner than inevitably was possible. But um, so I just got a liberal arts degree, which is uh, highly marketable, as everyone has told me. Oh, absolutely. Sorry. <laughs> that was a little sarcasm there. But, you know, a degree is a degree. I'm proud well, of it. What do you think about um, doing for a master's? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I'm really interested in um, language and literature and studying how that intersects with music and uh, non-lingual communication, if that makes sense. I know that's like a nerd thing, um, but I'm just You're interested. You're such a nerd, Julia. I am. I, I'm, I accept that I am. Um, but I also, I took this fascinating course on children's literature, and it made me feel like... I wanted to do something in the education world about just like how children learn and socialize themselves because here, you know, I'm in a, a college classroom and we're reading in all of my other classes this extremely dense material that's um, pretty heady and difficult and reading all these scholarly articles. And then I have one class where I am reading what children are reading when they are learning how to be a person in the world and really analyzing the messaging that's coming from there, you know? Um, so we read only uh, own voices authors and uh, read some queer children's literature. And that's just like something that I think is very important because I, you know, not to keep harping on political things. I mean, in every course of life, I find myself always engaging in this discourse with adults who have had experiences and maybe have ingrained beliefs that are so much more difficult to unravel or change or challenge successfully. Uh, and it makes me feel like real meaningful work could be with trying to take a preventative action with that, with just teaching. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that was a long way to say. I think it would be cool to be a teacher. <laughs> I think you're destined to be an educator of some sort because I, every time yeah. I talk to you, it comes up in conversation. I mean, going years back, I oh, think gosh. it's something that you're definitely, um, you think you've been thinking about for a long time. And I can only imagine how wonderful it would be for people who would be the recipient of, yeah. of that. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see what form that will take. I kind of can't imagine you teaching the um, normal, at least in non-pandemic times, academic yeah. school year of nine months and then going out on tour because I, I'm assuming in this world where you're an educator that you're still going to be a performing musician as well because from oh. a selfish standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> no, not selfish at all. But also that's very, that's very kind. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Well, speaking of being a performer, your mm -hmm. new record, Little Oblivions, is coming out in February, February 26th, and you released the song Faith Healer from the record first, and I have to say, it is so wonderful to hear new music from you, and that song is just fantastic. Oh, thank Tell you. me about that song. Oh, man. I That song I had started writing originally... Oh my gosh, I was in a hotel room in Portugal and I sat down and I wrote like the very beginning of that song about the longing that addiction creates for, you know, and in a way I guess it's reflected in the title of the record, like the the way that ultimately every, obliv uh, or every like, the substances we use, the escapist mentalities we have, the negative coping mechanisms, like these are all ways that we create little tiny oblivions in our own head too, because uh, reality is difficult and painful. Uh, it just is. <laughs> and then the more I started writing about like the, it, you know, I don't, I don't really have like a time set for creating songs. So sometimes they sit on the shelf for a year. And uh, when I took some time off and I was writing in 2019 and really sort of dismantling a whole lot of my ideas beyond uh, just the context of substance abuse, I started to realize how it's sort of like a game of whack-a-mole where people will 
try to fill a hole or negate an uncertainty or assuage a discomfort with all manner of things and how desperate at in every point in my life I have been for, uh, you know, for somebody to rub oil on my forehead and tell me that this is what I need to be doing or to give me a magic pill that will eliminate my anxiety or to stand at a podium and say, if you want to make political change, do these things, A, B, C. And how that doesn't really exist and it's sad to mourn losing. Like, it's sad to mourn that kind of mythos, but at the same time, it's really liberating, I guess. Well, let's listen to Faith Healer now. It's Julian Baker live on KEXB at home. record feels unsparingly honest and that song so incredible you've touched in interviews how 2019 was a difficult year for you you talked a bit about that in telling us what little what faith healer was about little oblivions was born over the course of that year that was kind of difficult for you and you said that in some ways you were just kind of documenting the year yeah. through the album how does putting pen to paper help you process these dark periods in your life and ultimately help you through? You know, I, I think there's a really clear sort of dichotomy in my motivations behind making music in the past with my records. Um, not to sound too self-analytical or self-obsessed, but I, you know, I often will write a song and then I will 
realize what that song is about many months later or even after it's been put out into the world. And I think that's how I came to music originally as a way to sort of dump all of my thoughts in real time into a a piece of art where there are less sort of maybe there are less taboos or uh, there seems to be a little bit more artistic liberty to say the things maybe that I really mean, but that I would never say in a conversation. And then from looking back at those, I can see what was going on in my psyche at the time uh, with some distance from it. But it's funny because this year or this, the year um, I, I spent putting this record together, um, you know, I was off the road and disengaging a lot from my identity as a musician. And I think that that was ultimately really helpful because I noticed, you know, I, I'm proud of Turn Out the Lights, but I think that coming off of releasing a record, I thought I was going to flop. And then all of a sudden having resources and labels and a booking agent and manager, um, I felt intensely, not even obligated, but just convicted to say something in my music that was ultimately positive if you know honest and sad at times and i think that i spent so much time like critiquing these words and trying to <laughs> i don't know not be inspirational but to use my music for a meaningful and worthy message and in that i think i sort of censored some real er feelings or maybe changed them or felt compelled to have a a summation or a point you know when i think about song appointments it's like me just telling myself that i absolutely have to believe that things are going to be fine because i have no other option and now i think that's avoidance behavior that's a little bit of a psychopathy and a little bit of wishful thinking and you know nihilism and op optimism can be reasons for inaction uh but yeah so i returned to making music on this record with the attitude of just having a place to sift through all my thoughts alone in my apartment and you know it felt good to write selfishly again you know, I often find that when someone has a very successful first album, as you did, and then they go on tour, they uh, you obviously wrote those songs before you went on tour and you had some space and time. But when it's successful and you go on tour, then they have to write the next album in that kind of crazy headspace and on tour and life in motion. And I'm wondering if Turn Out the Lights was written in that space. And then now it sounds like for Little Oblivions, you kind of thought I need to take the space for myself and be in a different headspace for this record. Oh yeah. And I mean, it's not even like I consciously said I need to take this space for myself. It's just that like I was spinning out, not very healthy and I wasn't able to do shows and all of my friends were trying to gently tell me to take a break or not so gently sometimes. But um, yeah, it's, and turn out the lights. It, I did write a lot of that record's material, like it coalesced on the road. And of course I would write it at home when I was home because I wasn't on tour 365. But I I think during that time, like the space in between Sprained Inkle and Turn Out the Lights, I was being constantly confronted by every night there's a show and there's a million eyeballs looking at me and I'm a performer. And I want to have something to say. I want to steward this position well and do something just or maybe just helpful with it. Um, and so it was like this constant reminder and awareness of my gratitude that I got to do the thing I loved for a living and that I got to play shows all over the world, you know. And also I was, I was like 21. Um, and it was very new, and I still had a lot of emotional growing left to do, and still do. But yeah, I think that constant reminder was a big factor in why I felt so moved to try to make something 
deliberately positive and why I wrote with the audience in mind so much more. When you, it sounds like you, uh, right after you finished school, you went into the studio and I'm wondering if you have started writing then or were the songs already written because the album is absolutely gorgeous and I'm wondering what period of time you were working on it. Well, it's it's interesting. I mean, this record is different from my previous records in many ways, but I think the, like this record was assembled piece by piece over the entire year and a little bit of like January 2020 um, because I was doing school and I was just randomly driving three hours down to Memphis when I had breaks or weekends or things and I would make like one song or two songs with Calvin, my very good friend uh, who uh, helped make the record with me and then sit on them for a really long time and think about production choices and open myself up to in more interesting sounds and more varied sounds. Um, but I had never done that before. I mean, Sprain Ankle was recorded in three days and Turn Out the Lights was recorded in like six. So I had always just, just because, you know, coming up playing music, I didn't have the resources to kind of languidly make a record, I suppose. I, or at least I, in my mind, had some sort of pressing urgency because you can only afford so much studio time and you only have this much time off of work. And, uh, yeah, it, uh, it really, I think, informed my music in being like, I just show up and play the songs and that's how they are. And this one I sat on much more. Well, you explored a lot of instruments on this new record, drums, bass, banjo, <laughs> and it sounds like you played a lot of the instruments yourself on the record. What drew you to expand your sound in this new way? You know, I don't know. I think maybe I had, I had had this feeling of fear for departing too much from, again, like what, what people expected of me. I, and that sounds... I mean, maybe it is shallow and maybe it is inevitable that, I mean, when you get positive feedback for doing a thing, for writing sparse songs, and then people come to you and say, I really like that, you should do that more, then I want to deliver to all these people in my life, the people who listen to my music, the people who give me money to make records, I, I, f I think I had a lot of fear and reservation about m making a band record. Um, and for some reason, I don't know, maybe it it's undoubtedly a little bit or a lot correlated with w working with Phoebe and Lucy on Boy Genius and sort of freeing myself from the, from the imaginary parameters I had put on my music. Um, and also I just missed, I missed being in a band. I missed onstage chemistry. Uh, and I wanted to have songs where I could have a band live. Uh, but then of course I'm a control freak about my music. So I had to play all the instruments myself and then make other people learn the parts. <laughs> it sounds phenomenal. I'm wondering once you made the decision and accepted that you were gonna go with a full band sound, were you able to just lean into it and enjoy it? Or were you still questioning that decision the whole time? Oh no, I think it clicked in my head, you know, because I, there are a couple of seven inches and things. Um, sorry, it's really dark in here. I'm gonna turn on a lamp, That's, it's four. All right. Um, but yeah. Oh, um, and then there was light. Yeah, much better. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, I, I think once, It was helpful maybe for many things to go wrong in my life at once, whether by my own design or not, um, because I think, you know, there is some reason why I was intentionally blowing up my own life, uh, actively working against the thing I had 
worked so hard to do for a living and jeopardizing it and um with my like self-destructive behavior and i think it brought me to a place where i wanted to do music even if it meant that i never toured again like i realized that if everything goes away and i come home from tour early and i go back to school and i just sit in a classroom and read that i still want to make songs because i like making songs and that was also really liberating to be to just have an awareness of how silly it was for me to take something so seriously and let it like interfere with just having a pure relationship with music or maybe pure is not the right word to use i don't even know if that's possible in a realm where my art is commodified that's probably an oxymoron but you know i think it just made me give less of a shit about things that aren't important and prioritize the things that are <laughs> well it sounds like you trusted your gut and the <laughs> results are incredible little oblivions is the new album from julian baker and let's hear a couple from that we have song in e which is you solo on piano and then a band cut called hardline <laughs> Julian Baker, live on KEXP at home. Enjoy. for forgiveness in advance it's for all 
Oh, that was so great. I'm so glad you decided to go the band route. And if you need the validation, um, you're definitely <laughs> going to get it with this record. Um, you shouldn't oh, need it, you. but um, no, of it course. turned out so wonderful. And you really mixed it up for us in this great set that you created for KEXP. These songs sound great. The full band songs, the solo songs, and... Uh, you're playing both acoustic and electric guitar and piano um, mm -hmm. on these songs. Does it get you excited about going on tour with a band? Have you thought about what the live show is going to look and sound like? Absolutely. I'm so excited. I have missed, you know, among all of my waxing philosophical about how being unable to tour has helped me reestablish maybe a more holistic identity for myself outside of just being a performer but I truly love to play shows and I have since I was a kid and on this uh record like to make you know um to make it I did all of the stuff but I'm going to have Calvin who helped me make the record and um my friend Matthew Gilliam who played in a band with me in high school called Forrester, and we've all known each other for a very long time. And nothing makes me happier than thinking about just playing music with the Memphis people that are essentially my brothers. Uh, you know, they're that close to me, and we all seem to be of this, like, united mind of prioritizing music and it feels really good. I'm really excited. And I'm really excited to have a heavy song, you know, 
<laughs> like a song that you can just actually bang your head to. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I know that you had um, done the NPR session um, with Haley, and you were just mm -hmm. kind of in the background um, rocking out. In fact, someone yeah. put a comment on that, something about, yeah, look at Julian Baker just back there in the background being so awesome. And do you sometimes just like um, that session with Haley Williams, do you just sort of enjoy chilling in the background, being the absolute hero or just rocking yeah. out? Yeah, it's great. It is so relieving to just play guitar, you know? Like that, first of all, that session was a dream come true because I adore Haley and uh, all of the players were so great and Becca is a good close friend of mine. Uh, so it did feel, it felt really familial, um, like a jam. And things like that helped me remember to be present in music, you know what I mean? I think because when I was on stage, standing by myself for a year and a half, and then maybe with Camille or with uh, Aisha, one other person, I was, I often felt not like, I, I would feel like, how is this audience not bored? This has been like an hour of me just playing songs with just my guitar. Um, and, but it's also like, it is a way to be seen that much. And I'm, it's funny, you know, I would say it's God's cosmic joke to make me a performer by trade because I really don't handle attention well. Um, well, anyway, um, but yeah, so I, I'm just so thrilled to be in a, in like a cooperative band setting where there is musical chemistry to play off of. Sometimes it's fun just to shred, too. It's fun just to shred. <laughs> well, I mean, it was very clear um, how much you enjoyed being in Boy Genius and the chemistry that you had with Phoebe and Lucy. And I imagine that's just an experience, you know, that will be profound for you for the rest of your life and the friendships and the, the creative connection, that, you know, that you made with two talent of, yes. of their caliber. Yeah. Um, I'm so happy for all of us that that came to fruition. And, oh, God. Uh, Me too. Mm -hmm. Speaking of collaborating, you teamed up with an incredible writer and music journalist, Hanif Abdurraki. Hanif. And yeah. he wrote an essay in lieu of an album bio for Little Oblivions. And Hanif also wrote a wonderful essay for KEXP for a mixtape week that we had. It was a week-long series um, where we had listeners share their mixtapes and we played them throughout the week. And he wrote a beautiful essay talking about the importance of the mixtape format as a kid when he was discovering music on the radio. And I'm wondering how the two of you connected. Wow. We, uh, we actually met, I believe the first time I was attending and I, did I perform or did I just give a PowerPoint? I don't remember. I was at um, a, like a Christian writing conference in Grand Rapids, which now seems a little bizarre given just like more context for everybody that I met there. But it, it was like I watched him read poetry in the auditorium and it was just mind blowing. And it's funny because I like we only interact with each other like very sparsely, but I feel an extreme kindredness with Hanif. Um, I think he's a very deeply feeling person and um, obviously an extremely talented writer uh, and uh, music journalist, but he we just reached out to him to write the bio because I wanted it to be from someone who is emotionally connected to the music and I knew that he was um but yeah such a bizarre thing to think about meeting him there I gave a powerpoint on the gospel and the hardcore scene 
it was a weird time in my life. <laughs> but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, the pairing makes so much sense to me as literature and writing are clearly part of your life and an I'm influence sure. on your work. And um, yes, he clearly enjoys your music and the essay um, was wonderful it's to read. So beautiful. Well, you've put together one wonderful last song for us. It's a cover and mm -hmm. um, it's a Seattle band. Mm -hmm. um, how did you choose this one? I love it. I love what you do with it. I, well, it's so interesting and, oh, forgive me. It's, uh, it's so interesting because I, I am a huge audio slave fan. I mean, I'm a huge fan of all things Cornell, uh, and like all of his iterations, but I am just particularly super on board with audio slave and I, I think that is because they have such more of a visceral uh, memory to me because it was like happening when I was growing up. And then I recently was doing like a dive back into Soundgarden and I heard this song and it was just flooring. You know, I, I think there are so many cuts off of the Soundgarden records that are it's like every song is so good and so complex and in a way that I feel like doesn't get maybe it does get represented but you know I think there's so much more there underneath the seminal grunge band icon um gosh yeah I don't know I mean, there's I'm nothing like belting out a sound garden or a, any Chris Cornell song. There is so, so much good. emotion in there, oh. and in imagining, you know, that you are making that voice, that sound. Yeah, yeah. no, I know. Um, and his his writing has always just been particularly haunting to me, um, but also like very. It's something that I feel very deeply. Um, yeah, but it's a beautiful song. Speaking, and I also feel weird because uh, I I heard the Brandy Carlisle version of black hole sun and i was like that is the best sound garden cover that will ever be done so <laughs> it's I don't pretty know. crazy <laughs> it's pretty crazy it's so good but you yeah. know like i said it just you're right the songs have so much meaning in the lyrics but just the sound and that voice and the energy behind it mm -hmm. i'm not a performer I, I know, <laughs> i'm not that but when i sing along in the shower i mean yeah. i just feel like I'm, you know, like I'm Chris Cornell. Yeah. <laughs> well, you yeah. do a beautiful job on this song. Let's listen to it. It's Julian Baker doing Fall on Black Days. What's a river after you? Come to life, and whatsoever I fought off became my life. Just when every day seemed to greet me with sparks and sparks of fading, now I'm doing time. Now I'm doing time. Hey 
That was Fell on Black Days by Julian Baker, live on KEXP at home. And when you were talking uh, right before you played that song, I heard a little noise in the background. Was that Beans? It was Beans. (laughs) I'm sorry. No, I love it. I noticed that you put your sweet dog Beans on a new merch shirt, the Beans t-shirt at juliebaker.com. It's awesome. I recently became an animal mom myself. I adopted two kittens a couple of months ago, and they have brought me so much joy. And I'm imagining that having a little furry friend at home um, that captures your heart has been pretty helpful during the pandemic. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I got beans at the end of 2019. So I didn't, you know, Lord, if she wasn't codependent before, she has to be now. Uh, But yeah, honestly, having an animal is so rewarding. And I never saw myself as a person who would be capable of taking care of an animal I you know I was just like I don't have my stuff together enough to take care of me all the time how am I going to take care of an animal and it's interesting Lucy actually came with me to get this dog (laughs) uh when she was down here in Nashville but I I don't know if you've experienced this but there is something about you know interacting with this living thing that you are responsible for but that you also have a relationship with and try to communicate with non-verbally and what it like what it means to be in relationship with human beings takes on a different meaning you know in a in a bizarre way it's made me just so much more merciful towards my parents not that I was ever like hateful towards them but just thinking like wow it is really so difficult to be the guardian of a life form and take care of it every day um and it also like I don't know it helps me like right now she's chewing on a bone and it's really loud and I'm trying to do this interview that I'm doing for my job because I'm a musician but she doesn't is she know right there let's get she's her in right the frame. there oh yeah hey go get her. come here Oh, she won't jump. She's all sleepy, but she's down there. <laughs> but, uh, <Aww>. hey. <laughs> yeah, but it, it makes can... me feel like, you know, there's an absence of kind of, uh, it, it makes me reevaluate like really binary terms like good and bad when, you know, the dog does something disobedient and yet cognitively it's like just trying to get its needs met. 
And I feel like there's so many things that human beings do to themselves and each other that are just convoluted versions of trying to get your emotional, physical needs met. And, um, you know, having this, like, I can't really be angry at this animal because I don't think that she's doing it out of spite or deliberately. Um, and it just makes me more patient with humans too, you know? I don't know. Sorry, I don't have to intellectualize everything. I have a dog. I really like my dog. <laughs> like, uh, no, I absolutely <laughs> agree with everything you just said. And yes. um, especially there at the end, they're just trying to get their needs met. There's no malice, um, yeah. you know, no intent there. And I know that my animals bring out the best in me. And I do take that out into the world. Yeah, me. definitely. That's only a good thing, right? Yes, yes. Well, Julian, thank you so much for talking with us today. Little Oblivion is coming out February 26th. I cannot wait. It's been so wonderful to get a sneak peek at some of those songs, um, the performances that you made for us. Absolutely beautiful. And I can't wait to see you here in our studios yes. at KEXP. Yes, I'm anxious to come back. Well, thank you so much. And thanks to all of our wonderful listeners who make these sessions possible. It's been really great for us to continue to bring live music into everyone's lives right now at these live on KEXP at home sessions. And we're so grateful to you, Julian, and all the artists who have kept music into our hearts. Of course, my pleasure. Discover new music at listenerpoweredkexp.org.